Tucker Carlson overtakes Joe Rogan on Spotify, now the number one podcast in America. How amazing that the top two podcasts in the US are truth tellers. Makes me optimistic. Chicken Wings advertises boneless, can have bones. Ohio Supreme Court decides. On its face, I don't actually disagree with this. I don't really think that how controversial is this about to be? I don't think boneless chicken wings have anything to do with them actually being boneless or not. Um, I think it has to do with the type of meat that you're using, um, like from which part of the chicken and how it's assembled, such that like if there happens to be like a bone in a boneless chicken wing, that doesn't mean that it's not a boneless chicken wing. Um, it means that somebody f***ed up at some point in the process, but uh, I don't know where this came from. And actually, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to make one step further. Uh, because I feel very strongly about this. Uh, everybody that's spamming question marks in chat is not a true enjoyer of uh, chicken wings. Because if you think the only difference between chicken wings and boneless chicken wings is whether or not they're boneless, you you just you either don't understand chicken or you don't ever eat wings. Because it's not. They are fundamentally different. On one end, my guess is boneless wings are probably, it's probably what, white, white meat? It's probably chicken breast meat that's just cut off and then made into basically chicken nuggets. Boneless wings are not wings at all. They're chicken nuggets. A boneless chicken wing is not an actual chicken wing. It is a chicken nugget. And if you think differently, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not eating you're not eating anything that's actually like a chicken wing. Just as a heads up, okay? In case you didn't know. All right. <clears throat> but to say boneless doesn't mean boneless is retarded. No, no. Well, what I'm guessing happened here just by the skim is the guy probably read, or I'm sorry, it sounds like the guy got an injury because he was eating a boneless chicken wing and somehow a bone accidentally ended up in the boneless wing. And I think he's trying to sue the restaurant for false advertising saying, oh, well, actually, you can't call them boneless chicken wings. But it is, they are boneless chicken wings, just a bone wound up in it. That doesn't mean you have to stop advertising them. As, that's what it sounded like in this court case. Oh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Boneless chicken wings have a fundamentally different texture from chicken nuggets. They are also bigger as well. You are just ring. Um, okay, they're not. White meat equals chicken nugget. Dark meat equals boneless chicken wing. You think that boneless wings are usually made from dark meat? I, well, to be clear, maybe some are. But traditionally, if you go to a restaurant and you get boneless wings and there's nothing else, or no information about it, usually that almost every time you would assume the meat is going to be white meat. You're obviously wrong, but you're not well read on the subject. Boneless wings are taken from chickens that are specifically raised without bones. Okay. Ground chicken equals nuggets. Whole white meat equals boneless wings. This is the only correct take. Don't they not ground, hardcore ground the chicken anymore for nuggets? I thought they usually lean into the, like, chicken breast white meat now. Like, they don't do, like, the sludge stuff anymore. I could be wrong on that, but I, I thought that they changed it. Do you think this guy just doesn't want to hit anything else but arms, or do you think he's telling the trust? You mean the truth? I can only train arms due to some muscle imbalance issues, and it's been this way for over eight years now. From the back, you can see that my left shoulder sits lower than the right. Any kind of direct back or chest work leads to a worsening of this muscle imbalance and ultimately uh, numbness in the left side of my neck and face. I found a way to do overhead tricep extensions because it stretches out the back and chest muscles that get tight and I'm pushing arms to the max and growing my physique best I can work with what you got baby I can only yeah the issue is that your quads and your glutes are some of the largest muscles in your body and they are protein demons why would you want these worthless fuck muscles consuming so much calorie uh, consuming so many uh, so much protein why would you want to waste it all on these when you could just be training the only muscles that matter now, he, he left out chest and shoulders. I'm assuming that arms becomes a part of that somehow. Yeah, uh, maybe not.
Close enough, whatever. Wings with bones are dark meat. Wait, are chicken wings? When you're talking about flats and drums, are those dark? I thought dark meat was like, um, I think like thighs and other, hold on. What chicken meat is considered dark meat? Found in the leg, drumstick, and thighs. Okay, you get a pass on that. Boneless are, are, I'm almost positive that boneless is made out of like chicken breast meat though, which is definitely considered white meat. Wait, do other muscles take from a limited amount of protein? I'm just, I'm kidding, I'm joking. I, that was a lie, okay? <laughs> That was a lie. I was just kidding. Let me use the restroom real quick. Hold on. Oh, hello. Wait, is he here? He's not here. The fuck? Hey. Hey. What's up? Okay, I'm so sorry. I went down like a mini rabbit hole and then I stopped immediately, okay? Yeah. I read the federal, okay. First of all, yo, these Federalist Papers are pretty dank. There's like a lot of information in them about, you know. Very dank. <laughs> what people thought about our government. Okay. You're, you've heard of the Second Amendment, right? Heard of it. Okay. I read, um, I read the Federalist Paper about the militias and all that bullshit, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I reread the Second Amendment. And I've kind of understood there to be this tension between like, what is a well-regulated militia versus like individual right to own firearms and all of this. After reading just that Federalist paper, um, and I got emailed a bunch of like historical facts about firearm laws, um, and then I reread the Second Amendment, I feel like the mm -hmm. Second Amendment has absolutely nothing to do with personal firearm ownership and everything to do with a state not having firearms taken from it by like the federal government. Am I wrong in that? Is there any historical fact anywhere to counter that narrative besides um, the, the case from the Supreme Court like 15 years ago? So did 
first of all, what the hell are you doing? Why are you looking at the Second Amendment? You have a debate on insurrection. I know. I'll get it. I'm about to do this. Hours. But I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Can you? Is yeah. there any strong argument for that? What the fuck? So what I think from what I recall of Heller, Heller was the first case that su the Supreme Court acknowledged that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to, to have guns and to possess guns. Yeah. Don't forget that as initially enacted, the Second Amendment wasn't a limitation on the states. Okay? I'm no, yeah, it seemed like it was a limitation on the federal government to deprive states of their right. ability to form so, militias, to form so armies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're kind of asking, like, where are, where are all the examples of states, you know, passing laws and being having them be struck down by the Second Amendment or something. I think you're approaching that. Or I'm basically I'm asking, asking is there any historical writing or evidence of anybody considering these firearm laws saying like all the laws that you hear today about like it feels like when people talk about it, firearms are important for self-defense and for people to rise up against the government. But historically, I don't see anything about self-defense. And when they say rise up against the government, they mean a state government to rise up against a federal government, not a citizen to rise up against the state government. Yeah, I think that that view, I agree more with that view, that it's the state, that like this whole Bill of Rights things was, was to protect the states. That's been kind of my, I think, the, the correct interpretation of the Second Amendment, uh, or sorry, all the Bill of Rights prior to yeah, the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, because it came from anti-federalists, right? It makes states. sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the states weren't going to impose limitations on themselves. Of right? course. They, they didn't pass the First Amendment to touch itself. It says Congress shall make no law respecting correct. an establishment of religion, yep. right? Um, it's it's only later cases where For, we have this kind of corporation of exactly, freedom, that yeah. kind of thing. And so the question is, well, but we haven't done the full Bill of Rights, right? Like we've, it's been selective because we, we think of some rights as not being incorporated uh, because of some other reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and one, and the question is like, is the Second Amendment, should that be thought of as an individual right to be incorporated, right? Or is it something that's not an individual right? Like we haven't incorporated the Tenth Amendment because like the Tenth Amendment is not an individual right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to think of the Second Amendment as, as the right of a state and kind of grounded down that way, that would like kind of be a, a basis not to incorporate the Second Amendment, but yet incorporate all the other individual liberties. Sure. Now you're asking me, what's the what's the evidence on the other side? You have to read Heller. You have to read Scalia's opinion in Heller. And that's how you're going to find out what he'll point to is he's saying, yes, it was for the protection of the state. Yes, it was for the militia. But it's a precatory clause. It's not a. It's just bullshit. Stating the, or okay. sorry, I'm just giving the other. Yeah, side. no, I understand. Yeah, I, I feel like it's not. He, yeah, because he, I read that part where he's like, oh no, well, it's just a first sentence. You could also, and then he rewrites it in another way, right? But it's like it feels like that's not just a random thing thrown in there. It seems like that's very like this is why it's for states to have organized militias that the federal government can't regulate against essentially the federal government is going to come and tell a state hey by the way we're snatching up all your firearms no more state militias no more armies for you it's only the federal army now fuck you the rewriting of that to say like well you know they added you know because states need to have militias therefore there's like a huge private interest in a private citizen never being deprived of a firearm even by his own state which as you said the purpose of the bill of rights i don't know if that was a protection as much for individual citizens versus like the anti-federalist argument for we need these guarantees in this bill of rights to ensure that like this federal government is going to overstep um and, and deprive states of their of their autonomy is what it seems like yeah i just I, argued I against that, it sorry i know you're giving the other argument yeah yeah mind. The, the full kind of throated thing is that Scalia views that the framers view the Second Amendment as protecting individual right to bear arms because that was the only way to protect the militias. The okay. way to protect the militias wasn't having some like some right of the state, but some ha having a right of the people that if the federal government wanted to um, in infringe on the state's right of militia, the first thing they would start doing is going after like individuals and that kind of thing. I, I, that's my sense of the argument that it is grounded out into the framers intentions, mm -hmm. but that it's, it's kind of like, and in the militia clause, but it's kind of like a, a second level beneath it. Sure. I happen to agree with the conception of it as a, as a militia based, right. Mm -hmm. And you see all the, the early gun laws, like there weren't these big expansive gun laws mm -hmm. in the early part of the country. The first ones were like in Texas, where they were trying to like stop black people from having guns, which, yeah. you know, it's a sordid history, but it's not, but there they upheld them, right? Same thing in New York, the, the Sullivan Act, I think was one of the first gun laws in the country, uh, at least in New York. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's just been, we don't have a ton of great precedent of like modern gun control laws back in the 1800s, uh, but there was, there's, there's some examples of it. And when they existed, they weren't limited by the second amendment.
Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I feel like with the way that it's written, I feel like, let's say, for instance, the federal government under Harris, you know, wants to do a, an assault weapons ban. I feel like Congress by the Second Amendment wouldn't have the ability to do that. But if the state of California said we're going to ban private firearm ownership for every single citizen, I feel like as written, obviously ignoring um, the Supreme Court case, I feel like as written, I feel like the Second Amendment would allow for that, that if a state decided they wanted to deprive all non-militia members or all non-military members of having a firearm, that the state would be within its rights to do that. But of course, as of right now, that would obviously be struck down immediately. Um, so, so that's interesting. So you're thinking like, a, that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. You're saying if the federal government tried to do this, and try to ban individuals' right to own these weapons. Yes, it would infringe on a on a state's right to have a militia. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, I feel like that. Yeah. Okay. Even though, okay, so you're kind of buying part of the part of the school, at least provisionally. I'm not holding you to it, and I don't think I, I think you're 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 on your journey, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, very narrow rabbit hole, a very small one right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of buying into the Scalia argument that okay, the way to protect militias is to protect an individual rights. But you're kind of taking the 14th Amendment Anderson approach, which is like, but hang on a second. The Section 3 was not meant to expand the rights of the states against the federal government. But you're kind of twisting it and saying, hey, hang on a second. This was not supposed to limit the state's rights. And so you're saying kind of from a structural argument, it doesn't make sense for states to be unable to do this. Um, it only makes sense for federal government to be unable to do this. Is that yeah, right? Basically, yeah. Like, I feel like now, like, it's always been difficult reading and arguing the Second Amendment as a guy that likes guns in the past just because of how, like, awkwardly it's structured. But with the historical framing that I have now, like, I feel like reading it, it makes perfect sense. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. I used to think before that that state was just like the USA, but it's not. To, to, uh, the free state, because the anti-federalists didn't want the federal government to become so much more powerful, right? Coming from the Articles of Confederation. They didn't want this idea that the federal government was now going to disband all of the individual militaries and have their own national army that was going to supersede them all and, and deprive them of their ability to protect themselves, right? Being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed like those first two parts are, are really important and it makes sense historically where it would sit but i don't think any of this has anything to do with like if a state decides oh well you know if you're in our state militia or our state national guard or whatever obviously you can have firearms and that's fine but if we want to say all private citizens we're going to ban all of you from owning every single firearm i don't see any part of the second amendment that would contradict that that it would be up to a state to decide that would be my feeling on it that's interesting i, I mean so you would kind of take you would say, yes, it says the right of the people. So you, you wouldn't deny an individual right to own guns. Congress wouldn't right have the ability people. to do that. But, but a Congress state, wouldn't have, yeah, but because, a state. The, because the, state, the state's interest in the right of the people to keep and bear arms is only insofar as like the well-regulated militia, yeah, which is necessary to the security of the free state itself, right? Yeah, so it would be up to the state to figure that out. So it sounds like you're leaning in the direction of being against the incorporation of the Second Amendment to apply to the state governments and that but you're not denying so like yeah if, i don't think it makes any sense to incorporate yeah. that it, it doesn't seem oh, well, like it but here, here's a question why, why should the second amendment apply to dc if dc is not a state so dc versus heller is the case right mm -hmm. under your view you, you know dc p passed a, a law essentially banning all handguns and that's the famous regulation that struck yeah. down dc versus heller would you say well since dc is not a state they can't ban gun. They they can ban guns there because the Second Amendment doesn't apply to things that are not states. I, in my head, I don't have like a conceptual mapping of where like just federal territory lays. So I would have no idea. I would have to embark yeah. on like a novel consideration of that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Because if you kind of take that maximalist view, or maybe you're you could take the view that it has to be with respect to a state, or you could take a more broad view of like, well, the federal government generally can't touch guns generally of people. Mm -hmm. That those are kind of two ways you could frame it as really focused on is this affecting states or or people within states or is this affecting any people with guns at all and it's kind of like a like a topic or like a a field preemption kind of deal where you uh, you've cleared out the field the government the federal government can't do these kind of big restrictions on on guns at all as applied to anyone within their jurisdiction but yeah you should you should read more into it i think it's um an interesting doctrine mm -hmm. and it's one that uh you have to contend, I think, with the, the strongest argument from the Second Amendment people are it's the right of the people. It does say the right of the people, right? Yeah, but and, I think that our I think that our understanding of and I could be wrong. I don't have the maximal historical background to understand, but it feels like really when we're talking about the right of the people, they really were talking about like states, not because like 
even all people like didn't vote right for president or the people you know um I, like women and black people <laughs> couldn't vote obviously yeah um yeah it, it doesn't feel like people there meant like every single able but like the way that it's evolved to to come to mean what the people are today yeah or maybe it did mean the people meant to, what they meant today oh but they just defined um, people differently but but no no but the thing about it there's kind of like two questions one is like do is this an individual right and to whom does it apply like the first amendment um says that you can't abridge the freedom of speech but it only applies to whoever it applies to it doesn't apply to private citizens uh, just like the 14th amendment deals with equal protection issues related to the federal government it doesn't apply to like it for example the 14th amendment isn't like some protected class framework where you have um where you can't have private discrimination, right? Like the um, Title VII and the kind of civil rights framework, that applies to private discrimination. But the 14th Amendment doesn't have anything to say about private discrimination. So you could take the view that, well, hang on, the Second Amendment is a right of the people. It is an individual right because it applies to the people, mm -hmm. but it only applies as to the feds. Oh, sorry, yeah, to the feds. Mm -hmm. That could be your view as well. And you could sort of keep your structural argument while making sense of the text of it. Sure. Where does, um, um, which amendment does incorporation come from again? Was it the 14th or 19th? There, there are different views, uh, different parts of the 14th Amendment. There's, there seems to be a growing consensus that there was some intentionality behind the 14th Amendment to incorporate at least some of the rights, mm -hmm. but different people will, will put it in different places. People like Clarence Thomas will put it in the privileges or immunities clause. You have to be careful. There's a privileges and immunities clause. Okay. So the privileges or immunities clause says that um, essentially States cannot, do you have the text in front of you? I, I, um, I'm looking right. at the 14th Amendment right now, yeah. yeah. Um, it's in, section, it's in uh, section one of the 14th Amendment, so it should say. No state yeah. shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge yeah. the privileges or immunities citizens. of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protections of the law. So some people say, and, and there's these cases called the slaughterhouse cases, which um, uh, reject this framework, but... Clarence Thomas wants to revive it. And a lot of people think it's a good argument. I don't think it's a bad argument. I just, I think there's a better argument um, or at least an equally good argument for the due process clause. But the argument goes, well, what are the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States? And the kind of standard doctrine is, well, those are the, the rights you have by virtue of your general citizenship and mm -hmm. so in, in the United States. And those, there's only like the right to interstate travel and the right to like, basically like the right to travel and like some very small other kind of rights. Another view is, well, no, the privileges or immunities of, of the citizen of the United States are the Bill of Rights. Those are the privileges or immunities. And now it applies to the states, right? Because there's a reference to the states. Hmm. Um, the other part of the 14th Amendment, which from which incorporation comes from, is the due process clause. And that's kind of the substantive due process piece we've been talking about, where it says, um, shall not to no state, right? No state shall deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law that when it says life liberty or property what does liberty mean well liberty means more than just physical liberty and so there must have been an idea of what liberty was being referenced there and and the best idea is the liberties that are in the bill of rights those is that are true that man when i read that i feel like liberty sounds like things that you would be deprived of for criminal charges especially because it's followed by without due process of law so when i think of liberty i think of having to pay a fine or having to be imprisoned right you can't deprive any person of life, capital punishment, liberty, right? My freedom, right? The ability to not be in jail and then property. So things like fining me or confiscating stuff without due process of law. So with process of law, you can take any of those three things away. What are, when you mention like the bill well, of is, rights. What, what, is liberty, what is liberty besides physical freedom? When you say, when you, are you saying that liberty only means physical freedom or liberty means. Maybe like I think in here, I think that's the strongest. Yeah. Things that you could lose basically to a, with a criminal conviction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would run down the substantive due process analysis because this is the same place that that kind of has w where the abortion and implied rights framework comes from. Sure. Um, and so uh, I would I'll point you to sources where you can see that. But but yeah, there's that's kind of like the procedural component to it is mm -hmm. the without due process of law. Like you can deprive them of this, you can deprive them of that, but just not without the right procedures. And then the sure. substantive component is kind of that implication of what liberty means. OK, um, so those are the two places that incorporation come through notice, though. Equal protection clause says no state shall deprive to any person the equal protection of the laws. Yes. 
that doesn't say the federal government. Yeah, which is fine. And that's cool. It makes sense why, you, like, the idea that you maybe want to prevent a state from passing a law, um, depending upon the right, the scrutiny level, that, that doesn't disproportionately impact one group of people over another. That kind of right. makes sense, right? Yeah. But by its terms, it mm -hmm. doesn't apply to the federal government, right? Because there's no, uh, the Fifth Amendment has a, a due process clause, which, as we expect, applies to the federal government, just like the, the rest of the, t the 10 Bill of Rights. But it doesn't have an equal protection clause in the Fifth Amendment. Uh, in the first original Bill of Rights. And so what the doctrine that develops, so you could imagine a law where the federal government says black people are not allowed to be public servants under federal positions. Why would that be unconstitutional? By the terms of the 14th Amendment, which only apply to states, it wouldn't, right? Um, you feel me? Yeah, I'm looking. So you're saying that technically without, if, without the 14th Amendment... There's no there 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 is no place besides the Fourteenth Amendment to find for equal, uh, protection. equal protection for the federal government, right? So what they have done is develop another doctrine of reverse incorporation, and that's in the Fifth Amendment. There's a due process clause. There is for the federal government. Say, yeah. yeah, and they say one of the liberties implied by the, by the Fifth Amendment's due process clause is the Fourteenth Amendment's equal protection clause, which obviously there's a there's a time lag problem there, right? Yeah. The Fifth Amendment clause came before. Um, and so, uh, but that once they pass, essentially, once they pass the 14th Amendment, that became one of the liberties that's protected by the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Um, Feels a little wacky, so, but okay. Yeah. So I'm just making you aware of those doctrines. They're, they're super interesting. Um, yeah. I'd be curious all, after, yeah. right after the founding of the United States, because yeah, a clean reading of the First Amendment says that very specifically calls out the federal government for not yeah. making laws. Yeah, did and any I, state and, have... And, and more than that, yeah. it's not just the federal government, it's just Congress. Yeah, yeah, well, that, they'd Congress be the one making the law, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so were, were there any states that recognized and established religion, prohibited free speech, yes. abridged... Oh, sorry. I don't know about recognizing a, a religion. Or broke the First Amendment states, in a variety of ways, yeah. There were states that had their own state bill of rights. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they created them, uh, sometimes based off of the of the federal bill of rights sometimes more expansive sometimes less so i'm not sure if there if there's a history of of um like a state established religion back in the day but certainly they were doing things that wouldn't pass muster under modern first amendment doctrine but but remember that like a lot of the modern first amendment doctrine is pretty recent sure. including a lot of the um the religion doctrines like there's a lot of recent case law from the like the 20th century that established these things and so yeah they wrote it down but if in practice everyone was a Christian, and in practice no one cared enough to bring a loss, there were like there was no like Pastafarian or edgy atheist or a person in like Rhode Island. Uh, there's a case out of Cranston, Rhode Island that, that became famous um, mm -hmm. because it, like one student was like, "Take down these uh, Ten Commandment prayers in yeah. the gymnasium," and everyone hated her. Um, but but yeah, like if there's no one bringing these suits, it's sometimes you know the doctrine doesn't get developed. But but yeah. Do you think in general, this will be the last question and I'll read this. Do you think in general we've kind of erred in the Supreme Court doing a little bit too much lifting here when it should probably have been constitutional amendments? Or do you think that it was appropriate that we get these like legal interpretations rather than having to amend the Constitution so much that it would become worthless? Would it undermine the Constitution if we amended all of this? Mm. Are you referencing like... So like, let's say for like, I, I don't believe in incorporation yeah. or that bullshit. We're just going to make the 28th or the 50th Amendment now saying, well, the First Amendment, we're going to rewrite that. We're going to revoke the First Amendment and say, um, yeah. neither Congress nor a state shall make no law, right? Yeah. Here's where, I, where I, I'm kind of okay with it. Okay. Um, and, and I say kind of because I think that there's, there's always going to be margin cases where it's unclear. There's always going to be cases that are obviously too much or obviously too little, shit like that, right? Mm -hmm. well, um. When I think of constitutional principles, a constitutional provision, a constitution and our constitution was made to last, right? Yes. It was made uh, to be an enduring union that people could work with and people could live under. Mm -hmm. And there was an expectation that these principles would be developed over time by the courts. That was an expectation of the framers. Yep. If they had to like debate what the first, the every possible thing of the First Amendment in the Continental Congress, or sorry, in the um, in Philadelphia when they were in the, sorry. The constitutional commit. Fuck, I'm forgetting the convention. You guys know it. Yeah. Um, if they had to debate like everything and abortion and this or that, no one would have passed it, right? No one would have spent all the time it took to develop all these doctrines. And so there was an expectation that these courts would develop the doctrines. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm okay with courts taking reasonable approaches to. And again, that's gonna people's minds may differ on what is reasonable or what's too much of a stretch. But I'm okay with that, general, and because I know how difficult practically it is to 
to change the Constitution. But let me give you an example, right? Yeah. So the Fourth Amendment, Equal Protection Clause, in the 1860s when they passed it, did you think that what they were doing was getting – was forcibly – sorry. When they passed the 14th Amendment in the 1800s, mm -hmm. do you think that they were – thinking in their minds that they were integrating schools? Absolutely not. Do you think that they were thinking, we're going to make a lot of protection for women? Absolutely not, right? Or gay people or whatever else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with the kind of like, uh, there are other amendments where you, where you can we look at this, and, and it's just obvious the people at the time did not think that what they were doing was fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. You know, First Amendment, did they think that what they were doing was um, sort of incorporating all the standards and exceptions of uh, that that now exists related to like broadcasting. Yeah, you know, obscenity that kind of maybe mm -hmm. maybe you can chart them, but it's it's a little touchy. You know, the yeah. the, fourth, the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. No one had like an idea of GPS data and like third parties having so much access to your information all the time mm -hmm. or like what if you put a tracking device on like is that a search if, if you kill someone is that a seizure yeah so, can you compel somebody to give a fingerprint and then use it to unlock an iphone <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like these are broad principles that aren't statutes a con uh, there's a famous case called mcculloch v maryland and in it marshall our favorite marshall says we must never forget that it is a constitution that we are expounding not a statute, so the statutory code. Mm -hmm. It is a constitution we are expounding. And so everything in terms of interpretation of a constitution needs to be viewed in the light that it it's a short document and it's meant to have an enduring union. And that's why I think it's okay for courts to interpret and elaborate and develop. I think that's part of what our courts were designed for. Gotcha. Except when they go unhinged and start doing Yeah, because I was going to say, like, because if, if we take this interpretation— we're saying that the the Supreme Court has a fairly unique link to to the Constitution, right? And that the Supreme Court can literally reinterpret it for us in ways that the executive and the legislative can't. Um, but they're also limited in power by other ways, right? It's just nine judges. They don't have anybody speaking up for them or fighting for them in the legislature or anything like that, right? So you can understand that. But the... Um, Man, I feel like then you have to weigh concepts like the like stare decisis have to become like cornerstones of constitutional interpretation because you run into situations where the Supreme Court has a lot of power, but we're saying it's okay because there's like a collective wisdom that, you know, goes through the ages for judicial decisions yeah, and so. statutory interpretation. But like, yeah, if you get a court that comes in and like, ah, we don't agree with this. Ah, we don't agree with this. Like you could theoretically, I'm not saying it would happen, but like you could theoretically get a court that's like, you know what, Marbury, we don't actually think that was ruled correctly. Or we don't actually agree with incorporation. And now you're like, oh shit. I'm going to, I'm going to inject a little realist. Yeah, go. A realist pill in you. Uh -huh. So before you were like losing your mind at Clarence Thomas, right? You were like, how could it be that he was talking about something that's like not an issue before the court, right? Yeah. And I agree. That's that's totally messed up. Well, I'll be a that. little bit more clear. Because I think it's okay to opine on some things, but it was it wasn't random. It seemed very purposeful. It seemed quite I unnecessary. I and it seemed very yeah, that was yeah, go ahead. I don't disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Um and so what I'm doing is it's a little devil's argument, but sure. uh, just to give you something. In the original Marbury case, again, reminding everyone of the fact pattern, mm -hmm. Marbury is supposed to be sent to commission by Marshall when he's the Secretary of State, supposed to send it. And Marshall, who is the Chief Justice uh, eventually, and who rules on this case, doesn't send it to him. And so Mar uh, Marbury sues in the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, directly in the Supreme Court. And he says, make him send me the commission. Make uh, Madison send me the commission, who is now the new Secretary of State. And the court eventually rules that it has no jurisdiction. And it says so because the Judiciary Act that purportedly, in their mind, granted them jurisdiction was unconstitutional. That's the holding, right? Mm -hmm. and that's the judicial review, right? What, no one even remembers what Marbury versus Madison, what was the judicial review at issue in that case? Was it a gun law? No. Mm -hmm. Was it the First Amendment? No. It was the constitutionality of the Judiciary Act uh, that was supposed to, supposedly, in their mind, gave jurisdiction to the Supreme Court to hear in its original jurisdiction as a trial court um, this case from Marbury. Mm -hmm. But before it went to that holding, right, before it got to that central holding, and, and remember, if you don't have a, a jurisdiction, what you're supposed to do is say, dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. What it did for two whole other sections was talk about how bad Jefferson was and how unfair this was, and, and it was like giving an advisory opinion on, on why Marbury deserved this commission and why they were wrong to send it to him. And so 
even in that first opinion, we have huge conflict of interest and an enormous unnecessary advisory opinion talking shit about Jefferson mm -hmm. when it didn't have to, when all it should have done, right, under the modern view of like what court should do is dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. So true. Although I would say to devil's argument, the devil's argument, my guess is going to be that the reason why we wouldn't want the court opining on things is because there's so much more case law and so much more understanding before the court uh, that that's come before or that's like prior to this, not like what's come before the court in a case that like maybe back in the 1700s or the early, early 1800s, you kind of did want this guidance because everything was kind of like new and uh, uncharted territory, you know, maybe. Yeah, but maybe. But uh Seemed like they were doing some some wacky things, but sure. but note the 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 Supreme Court didn't use its uh, judicial review power for for decades after that. Sure, um, and I will say though, because somebody told me, I think you might have mentioned a certain Federalist paper. I don't know if I told you this or not, but I did read it afterwards, and the arguments oh, for judicial you? review were overwhelming. I was I'm surprised yeah. the court didn't originally originally have judicial review because in that particular paper that was I think it was a Hamilton it's, paper, he lays out yeah. everything relating to judicial review in it, 100. percent Yeah. Yeah. Be, be careful. Uh, I think the Federalist Papers are some of the best sources mm -hmm. to understand what the Constitution meant. Yeah. But remember, and, I, and you don't need to remind you, but more for the audience, because I think you literally say this. These were advocacy pieces. These yes. were debate pieces. Mm -hmm. These were meant to convince people. Um, and so, yes, we should take them as authoritative, but always remember who the audience is, who they're talking to. Yeah. Um, and even when you say authoritative, what we mean is what it's really giving us is insight into the minds of the writers at the time, not what ultimately readers. would have ended up in law, right? Because th you can see what they wanted to do, but that might not, have, might not have always been the thing that made it at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But no, wait, no, I'm not leaving uh -oh. for another minute. Okay. You have to read this paper. Yeah, I've got the brief open and right now. And you have to watch that small little clip that of me with Nor. And the reason you have to do that is you're going to fuck up. Uh-oh. Because you're going to mess up. Because what you're going to do is you're going to focus on, A, you're going to let him ask you all the questions, which you cannot let yourself do. Okay. Or you're going to focus on what Trump did when that shouldn't be your focus. The focus on Trump should only be with respect to the motivations of the people in um, in the in and around the Capitol, because those are the strongest cases of insurrection. Okay. You, I also believe that Trump engaged in insurrection. But if you spend all this time talking about what Trump did behind closed doors, you're going to lose yourself because you, this is a debate about insurrection. And the clearest, most obvious cases of insurrection on mm -hmm. January 6th are the people who actually used violence, all right? Sure. And so if you're spending any time talking about the internal deliberations, unless it's kind of like some tangent, you're, you're wasting energy. Once he concedes that there was at least some amount of insurrection on January 6th, you've won the debate, because that's the debate, is whether January 6th was an insurrection. And so you don't need to prove that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection to prove that January 6th was an insurrection. That's number two. And then in the clip I'm showing you, and that I want you to see, mm -hmm. It's how to force them to justify any definition they come, or at least signal to everyone watching that they, are un they don't have an affirmative stance. They're either taking a stance that it's not an insurrection or that it is an insurrection, or they're saying, I'm agnostic or I don't want to say. But whatever that is, it should be known. And you should be asking them questions about, if they provide a definition, why they're justifying that. Um, so that's why I want you to watch that clip, okay? Okay, I'll do my best. I love you. I love you, babe. Fucking nerd. Um, okay, my current understanding of like what an insurrection is, like the definition I've got running in my head, I guess I'll just write it in here to track it. Um, I'm, I'm largely borrowing this from that um, Paulson and Baud paper, but it's a little nebulous, but I, I think we can probably nibble around the edges. And whatever it ends up being like in solid form, J6 is way, way, way past that. But um, <clears throat> I guess I'll, just, I'll, edge, I'll um, sketch this out here. Just a bit. So my current understanding of like what I would say an insurrection is, is an insurrection is a violent, um, we'll say a violent event where the goal is to uh, significantly disrupt 
some essential form of government uh, exercise of control. Uh, so the two things that you're going to fight over the most here are what does significantly d disrupt mean and what does like essential form of government control mean? Um, and so because so like, for instance, if you just say that it's where any disruption happens of government exercise, then the question would be, OK, well, let's say some people protest outside of like a post office. Well, was that an insurrection or um, let's say that some people um, let's say that some people managed to totally shut down a government email address, right? You've significantly disrupted something, but like, was that an essential form of government control? Probably not. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember if Paulson and Bod had the transfer of power thing in there. Would, be, would the usurping of a power to replace with another be part of the insurrecting? I don't think that would necessarily be it, but... Um, disrupt? Nah, I think we'd have subvert, but... Before we have this amicus uh, brief, or curie, I'm sorry. Was Chaz an insurrection? I would have to do more reading into the Chaz stuff, but uh, based on the limited understanding of it, I feel like it would be. Um, I feel like it would be. Because didn't they basically replace the local government with their own kind of government for some weeks or whatever? Was it not that? It feels like it would be. All right, let's read, see if we can borrow from this at all. So these are um, things that were thrown into uh, the Donald Trump versus Norma Anderson case. Um, I think this was the immunity one, right? United States, Supreme Court, Trump v. Anderson, correct it was, okay. Okay. <clears throat> Mark A. Graber is the Regents Professor at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. Um, let me, I'll take notes on this. Let me write down exactly what we've got here. Don't you have a debate right now? Oh, it's in two and a half hours. <sighs> Mark A. Graber is the Regents Professor at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. The Regents, oh, sorry, fuck, one more thing, and I'm just reading this, I'm sorry. Do you feel like there's any value in reacting to Asman's recent takes on J6, Kamala being nominated? My goal is I really want to try to find a large content creator. I don't know if it would be a, um, like a commentary community guy or if it would be uh, Asman Gold. I try to add him on Discord. We'll see if he accepts me and walk them through something. Basically, can I find a guy who's kind of like independent or not like hardcore conservative and then walk them through the fact pattern of J6 and convince them, hey, do you think this was an insurrection now? Like starting from a place of very good faith, very high charitability, assuming they just haven't seen all the facts and then just laying it out as plainly as possible with as many links, videos, and everything as possible. Yeah, I think Asman Gold would be a great person to do that with. Mm. But I'd be asking him to sit through like a two to three hour Convo with him, yeah. Did you, why did you remove Aspen from Discord? I don't know. I don't know if I removed him or if he removed me or if this was back in the day when neither of us um, were actually friends on Discord, but we had it set so that non-friends could DM us. I'm not sure, but we have DM'd in the past, but we're not friends right now. I don't know who removed who or what happened there. I don't remember. What the fuck is this? Oh, dumb.
Isn't the issue kind of lost because it needs two hours of explanation? No, I can I can get it down to 15 minutes. It just, um, but I'll go through a long explanation first. Like my 15 minute video will link to probably like a two or three hour video, I imagine, but the longer video will be for people that are like super mega conservative or have argued that or seen evidence to point in that direction, but okay. The Regents Professorship is the highest honor in the University of Maryland system. Professor Graber is the seventh position to hold that honor, or seventh person to hold that honor. Professor Graber has taught constitutional law for over 30 years with a specialty in American constitutional development. He has researched the framing of sections 2, 3, and 4 of the 14th Amendment for almost a decade. Professor Graber has published several articles on the centrality of these provisions to constitutional reform during Reconstruction. He is the only scholar to have published a peer-reviewed university press book on the subject. Okay. Mark A. Graber has spent over a decade researching the framing of sections 2, 3, and 4 of the 14th Amendment. Asimov will never talk to you. He doesn't want any controversy whatsoever. Take on stream. He said that he wants to be in an echo chamber because he's 35 years old and doesn't want his view to be challenged. <laughs> Wait, what? Not debating Andrew. What does my stream title say? It didn't say that at all. Okay, gotcha. This amicus brief provides accurate historical information on the constitutional law of insurrection from the framing of the Constitution to Reconstruction. The following pages detail what American lawmakers, courts, and legal commentators understood to be an insurrection and what they thought constituted participating in one. So an amicus brief is when a court is deciding a particular thing, a person can basically write in to support on a legal basis, like a given argument from one side or the other, right? Um, I don't think that amicus briefs are meant to be written to introduce new facts. I think it's just meant to be introducing new, like basically, arguments. Argument summary. When Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was framed, constitutional lawyers recognized that an insurrection involved A, an assemblage, B, resisting any law or interfering with the course of a government proceeding, C, by force or intimidation, and D, for a public purpose. Okay, we can steal some of this. Um, we're going to say let's see. Section 3 was drafted. Insurrection involved an assemblage. Assemblage. Resisting any law or interfering with the course of a government proceeding by force or intimidation for a public purpose. I think this is going to be, this is a bit broad, but we'll see how he, yeah, it doesn't. Persons engaged in an insurrection when they incited, assisted, or otherwise acted in concert with others bent on resisting law by force or violence for a public purpose. The members of Congress who played a crucial role drafting Section 3 stated that no difference existed between inciting and engaging in an insurrection. Colorado Supreme Court adopted legal standards that are consistent with how the legal community understood insurrection at the time Section 3 was framed and ratified. In particular, the justices applied the correct 19th century standards to decide whether an insurrection occurred on January 6th, 2021, and whether Donald Trump engaged in that insurrection. argument. A legal consensus existed from the Constitution's framing to Reconstruction that a constitutional insurrection occurred when two or more persons by force and violence resisted the execution of any law for a public purpose. Insurrection at the time Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was framed and ratified had a precise and well-understood meaning, well-understood constitutional meaning. 
Um, this is a paper that he's linking to. That understood meaning was articulated by the Supreme Court. This is an 1863 Supreme Court decision, U.S. v. Burr, by Supreme Court justices writing circuit, by other federal judges, by state court judges, and by the leading legal treaties writers uh, during the period between ratification of the, cons uh, of the Constitution and Reconstruction. Um, okay, what are we citing here? Uh, a Supreme Court writing circuit. So we've got our district court is our lowest level federal court. Then you would appeal from that to your circuit court, which is your, like, you've got, I think it's 12 different circuits. It's like 11 circuits plus D.C. or something. Or is it 13? How many circuits in the U.S. federal court? Um, this is like your court of appeals. It's 12 circuits. Okay. I think it's 11 circuits and then the, uh, oh, no, no, wait, it's 13. I'm sorry. Um, you've got your district courts, and then you've got your Supreme Court. Um, back in the day, I don't remember when this stopped, but Supreme Court justices used to drop down to circuit courts and make decisions and, writ, and write on, on decisions uh, in the circuit courts. And these were called, uh, this was referred to as writing circuit. So sometimes you'll see Supreme Court justices writing or making rulings on things in the past that weren't Supreme Court cases, but it's because they were ruling in a, in a lower court. Um, is there a reason we don't hear from old presidents like Reagan is still alive, but I don't even know the last time he had an opinion? Didn't Reagan die like 10 years or five years ago? Um, also, um, I think generally just presidents, old presidents by, um, it's a norm just not to comment on current presidents. They just don't do that. I think that's just a norm that's developed. I don't know when it developed, but over the past like 30 years, it's just. Wait, how long ago did Reagan die? Why do I feel like I remember Reagan's fucking funeral? What am I thinking of? Reagan died in 04? Wait, who was the big guy that died? Like, was it really just that long ago? Yeah, Reagan's been dead for way longer. Wait, who the fuck am I thinking of? Oh, I'm thinking of Bush Sr. Yeah, same thing, whatever. Maybe, I, I must be thinking of Bush Sr., yeah, my bad. But Reagan also had like fucking Alzheimer's disease. I don't even know if he was there for like his last year in office. He was kind of like one foot in the grave, or at least cognitively. Um, okay. Do you feel the change or the charge delivered by Judge Field to the grand jury and paneled for the Circuit Court of the United States for the Northern District of California at the city of San Francisco on the 13th of August, 1863, treason and rebellion being in part the legislation of Congress and of the state of California? Um, the law of treason, opinion of Judge Swain upon a question. Of, oh, these are just it's not citing any words. It's just saying what it's citing to. Okay. For the crime of treason would be committed by any citizen who shall resist by force any law of the United States or adhere to their enemies, giving them either comfort. An intent to overthrow the government is not treason without an overt act. Jesus, the footnotes here are huge. George Boutwell. A member of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, responsible for drafting the 14th Amendment, set out the 19th century consensus when writing the Constitution of the United States at the end of the first century, 1895. <clears throat> These 19th century American jurists understood an insurrection against the United States to be an attempt made by an assemblage to obstruct by force the implementation of federal law for public reasons. That's a better one, okay. General agreement existed among judges and influential legal commentators that the four elements of an insurrection were an assemblage, uh, resistance to a law, force or intimidation, and a public purpose. Section 3 used insurrection in this commonly understood sense while limiting the scope of that provision to insurrections against the Constitution of the United States as opposed to insurrection against state laws. One, a legal consensus existed. <coughs> Sorry, my mic glitched there. A legal consensus existed from the Constitution's framing to Reconstruction that a constitutional insurrection did not require an effort to overturn the government. Americans in the 19th century regarded insurrection. Dude, my brain is fucked. Every single time I read regarded, I think retarded now. <laughs> fuck me. Um, yeah, fuck me. Americans in the 19th century regarded insurrection as a synonym for levying war with the proviso 
as Chief Justice John Marshall noted in United States v. Burr, that levying war was a technical term. Um, let's see, footnote 9 is one of the petitioner's amicus briefs concedes that the term insurrection may have had a relatively well understood common law meaning at the time of ratification, but insists without citing a single source published from 1789 to 1868 that the term insurrection against the Constitution did not. Um, the sources discussed in this brief discuss the constitutional meaning of insurrection. No evidence exists that the persons responsible for Section 3 thought the phrase, the phrase insurrection against the Constitution provided a new definition of insurrection. Could you share the document with the links to the articles you're using for your manifesto? Share the document with the links to the articles you're using for your... What do you... You mean my thing? Just destiny.gg slash notes. Levying war in the constitutional sense did not require, as several amici briefs, amici briefs claim, an attempt to overthrow the national government, massive armies too strong to be resisted by ordinary law enforcement, an invasion, a violent national conflict, or a declaration of war. Persons levied war against the United States when they sought to overthrow the federal government, but also when they resisted by force a federal authority or the implementation of any federal law. Adjudicating a case arising from the Whiskey Insurrection, Justice William Patterson and U.S. v. Mitchell declared an insurrection with an avowed design to suppress public offices is an act of levying war. When charging a jury during the Civil War in 1861, District Judge David Allen Smalley maintained, if a body of people conspire and meditate an insurrection to resist or oppose the laws of the United States by force, they are only guilty of a high misdemeanor, but if they proceed to carry such intention into execution by force, they are guilty of treason by levying war. Judges and treaties writers during the 19th century differed, deferred on the precise difference between a rebellion and insurrection, but they agreed that the phrase insurrection or rebellion covered small-scale violent resistance to authority, as well as attempts to overthrow the national government. Many commentators made one of two distinctions. Francis Lieber maintained that a rebellion was an insurrection in which the insurgents intend, intended to overthrow the government. The term rebellion, he wrote, is applied to an insurrection of large extent, emphasis in original. Webster's Dictionary in 1865 defined insurrection as a rising up of individuals to prevent the execution of law by force of arms, revolt as a casting off the authority of a government with a view to put it down by force, and rebellion as an extended insurrection and revolt. More often, judicial opinions and commentary distinguished a rebellion from a mere insurrection. Senator Willard Salisbury of Delaware maintained that an insurrection is the act of unorganized individuals uh, as opposed to rebellions which required states or organized political communities. This court adopted a similar distinction between insurrections and rebellions in Brig Amy Warwick when describing the Civil War as no loose, unorganized insurrection, having no defined boundary or possession, numerous, states, uh, numerous state cases quoted or paraphrased this passage. Andrew said he'll debate you after today's topic about which RPG is the best of all time, excluding FF9, as it's both his and your favorite. FF9 is not my favorite. Nice try, though. What's your favorite? It's either Seven or Tactics, obviously. People that say FF10 was their favorite Final Fantasy are the same people that say the prequels are the best Star Wars movies, okay? You're just young. This court adopted a similar distinction between insurrections and rebellions in Brig Amy Warwick, uh, 1863, when it's from the Civil War. No okay, we got this. Now, loose, uh, unorganized insurrection, having no defined boundary or possession. Numerous state cases quoted or paraphrased this passage. Have you heard of the Final Fantasy Tactics remake that was announced? Hell yes, I will play that game, 1 billion percent. The Tactics remake and the Factorio DLC, or Factorio 2, whatever you want to call it. Several amici briefs uh, correctly observe that 19th century Americans often spoke of insurrection and rebellion in the same sentence. Both were considered serious crimes, deserving of serious sanctions, and meriting disqualifications from office holding. This association 
No more equates rebellion and insurrection than Section 3's declaration disqualifying those who had held any office, civil or military, equates civil and military offices. General Henry Halleck contrasted rebellions with mere insurrections, the acts of such individual insurgents, in resisting or opposing the authority of the government. The Supreme Court in the Amy Warwick Prize cases declared insurrection against a government may or may not culminate in an organized rebellion, but a civil war always begins by insurrection against the lawful authority of the government. A rebellion, what I put this in italics? They reached a sufficiently large scale or was intentionally organized to overthrow the government. Well, these were often spoken about um, in conjunction with one another. They were understood to mean different things. against a government. Insurrection against the government may or may not culminate in an organized rebellion, but a civil war always begins by insurrection against the lawful authority of the government. A civil war is never solemnly declared. It becomes such by its accidents. The number, power, and organization of the persons who originate it and carry it on. When the party and rebellion occupy and hold in a hostile manner a certain portion of territory, have declared their independence, have cast off their allegiance, have organized armies, have commenced hostilities against their former sovereign, the world acknowledges them as belligerents and they contest a war. That's a good quote. When the music is this quiet, it just sounds like annoying background noise. Oh, that's because this is annoying, glitchy music. How mad are you? Stay mad. Is this the majority opinion written by who? Let's see. Mr. Justice Greer? I don't even know if they wrote like it, it was like majority opinions and everything back then. But that's who wrote it, right? Who's moderating this debate? Myron. <clears throat> An insurrection could be aimed at secession or overturning the government, but as demonstrated in the insurrection trials of persons involved in the Whiskey Insurrection, the Fries Insurrection, and the Christiana Riots, and the Tau Insurrection, Insurrections were often local affairs. Insurrections occurred in 1794 when Pennsylvania farmers burnt the house of a tax collector. In 1799, when John Fry's and friends made a show of arms that resulted in the release of persons charged with federal tax evasion. 1847, when Hispanic and Native Americans attacked occupying American office officials in New Mexico. In 1851, check out the wreckage system on YouTube. You might like it. The fuck is that? In 1851, when Pennsylvanians obstructed official efforts to capture an alleged fugitive slave, and in 1856, when rival forces were violently resisting laws on slavery. They're good examples. I feel like it's cheating if Andrew's watching Destiny off stream to have some upper edge. I mean, I think my arguments are correct. If he watches me, that's fine. I don't care. It shouldn't matter. 